Greetings and welcome to Behind the Curtain. Here on Behind the Curtain, we're going to look at the world of community theater. I'm your host, Susan Harrington. Today, we are being joined by Karen Durbin. Karen is an actress and a director. Welcome, Karen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Well, I want to ask you, of course, a few questions, obviously, like I always have something. You're an actress and a director. How does one inform the other for you? Well, um, I started out as an actor, um, and it, I think... The easiest way to explain it is as a director, you're sort of responsible for the big picture moments. And as an actor, you're sort of only responsible for your lane. Um, you're responsible for um, interacting with other actors, but you're responsible for your part and your part only. Um, and as a director, um, having had the experience of that piece of it, um, I had to then expand. Um, so it was much easier to go back to acting after directing than it was the other way around. <laughs> um, because as a director, having worked with actors, um, I learned all of the things that I really liked about actors <laughs> as a director <laughs> and all the things that I thought, huh, I don't really enjoy working with people who do that. So the next time I was an actor, um, I said, I'm going to remember that as a director, I didn't really like that. Mm -hmm. So it made me a much better actor oh. after directing. Um, I found that, um, I was a lot more specific in my choices when I started as an actor. My starting point was a lot more specific, knowing that a director could then shape those choices. Um, I also was a lot more polite to the other folks who worked behind the scenes, <laughs> <laughs> having worked as a director, um, because you see how much goes on other than just what you're doing as an actor. Uh, I find that actors in general, being one myself, tend to be much more selfish. Oh. <laughs> we're only interested in what we're doing <laughs> and what others are doing. Um, and the tech folks and directors uh, have to be much more aware of everything, how all the pieces work together. Um, and so once I had directed as an actor, I found myself being a lot less selfish and a lot more aware of how everything else was working around me. Um, as a director, I found that I was able to use what I enjoyed as an actor getting from a director. So specifically, directors give actors notes. Um, here's how this beat, this moment can be improved. Here's how the overall arc of the story can be told differently. So I used what I liked from other directors um, as an actor, getting as an actor, to inform my directing. So the things that I liked I then translated into being a director. Um, but what I also learned, the best directors that I have worked with in my career find a way to tailor their directing to each individual actor. So they look at an actor and they say, okay, this actor needs a lot of positive reinforcement. They need lots of, hey, you're doing a great job. Um, so they give them a lot of positive feedback. Um, they look at another actor and say, okay, this actor doesn't really need that. They need very specific, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. I need you to do that. And so they kind of tailor it to that. And so seeing directors who are able to do that really well and being an actor who kind of needs different things depending on what show I'm doing, mm -hmm. um, 
I informed my directing with those types of things. And I hope I have been somewhat successful at it, but it's a learning process. Okay. Um, and every actor, every new actor I work with informs being a, my being a better director. Um, and every new director I work with changes me as an actor, as do my fellow actors. It's the best part of being involved in theater, which I think you know as well, is the collaborative process, the, the people that you work with. It's, it's not a solo endeavor. It takes a lot of people to put uh, a play together. Truly a village. It does. <laughs> um, and as a director, the best thing that you can do is surround yourself with really talented people. Um, and when you choose wisely, the process is a wonderful experience. As an actor, you're kind of at the mercy. <laughs> you don't have that control. You're at the mercy of the people that are chosen around you. Um, so you just have to make the best of what you're given. But with as a director, you have so much control over who gets chosen in that process with the producer. Um, and that collaborative process um, is what makes it worthwhile. Okay, because here's the funny thing. I was going to say to you, uh, well, when did you begin acting and what drew you to it? But I, some of it you've kind of already said. But yeah. What, when did you begin? I mean, was it? I was three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think at a very young age, my parents were like, okay, what do we do with this child? Clearly, she needs an outlet. <laughs> Let's put her on the stage. Um, so I went to nursery school and the, uh, my first, I have this vague memory of like being on stage and like singing and like dancing with like, you know, pieces of cloth and, <laughs> um, and just loving it. Just loving the experience of um, applause, obviously when you're that yeah. young. But just like being with people that you love and, and creating something together. Um, and I did it all throughout grade school and junior high school and high school. And, um, and it was what drew me to it consistently was storytelling the ability to tell a story, okay. right? Like to be part of that storytelling. Um, when you're young, it's usually fairy tales, yeah. right? Like, I remember we did, like, Bambi you know, <laughs> in, like, first grade. or um, And then as I started to get older, I noticed that, you know, in grade school, much of the storytelling was centered around male characters and boys. Um, and when I was younger... I got to play those male characters and boys because I was the one who always put their hand up first and said, well, I'll play the biggest part. <laughs> they have no problem doing that. <laughs> and when you're younger, that's not a problem, right? You're a kid and they don't care. It doesn't matter. It's a fairy tale or, you know, so you can play the boy, you can play the girl. Nobody cares. Um, and in junior high school, I had a, a wonderful drama teacher, Mrs. Bonnie Udo, and she recognized fairly quickly that I was a character actress and not a lead oh. actress um, because lead actresses, when I was young, were uh, ingenues. I was I <laughs> <laughs> that was our choice. We didn't really, you know, the, the character parts were male parts. Um, there weren't a whole lot of female character parts. You were femme fatale, or you were ingenue, or you were mom. That was basically it. Um, and she recognized very quickly that that was not my niche. <laughs> um, Didn't and you put up something at Hubby that said, or some show that you were doing, you said, thank you for casting me as the ingenue. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> It was usually an ingenue gone bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those I often had an opportunity to, to play. Um, but because she recognized that and she instilled in me the idea that 
there was still value in playing characters that mm -hmm. weren't just pretty. You didn't just have to be pretty. Um, that kept my interest. Um, and then unfortunately I went to high school and we had a, an awful high school director <laughs> who only put on like the traditional plays. The and, yeah, that, and, and so that um, sort of showed me that we needed to expand the stories that we were telling um, and, and how, how would we do that? How would we find ways yeah. to do that? Um, but I still had opportunities, like we did Peter Pan and I played Nana, the dog. I was going to say this to the dog, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, in full dog costume. I did my own barking, very proud of that. Um, and I played a pirate. So, um, but that was the type of thing that yeah. I was relegated to because I couldn't play Juliet or Ophelia or the young Anjani. Not that those aren't wonderful roles for the right person, but that isn't who I am. Um, and so I had to sort of forge my own path. Yeah. So. Well then, okay, so, then what, what drew you to begin, or why did you begin, I think in a way you may have already kind of alluded to it, to directing? So that's why. <laughs> um, it, it's, you, you kind of decide to take control of your own destiny, right? Okay. Like, how do, you, how do you get these stories told? And the, and the way you get them told is by telling them yourself. Okay. Um, there are so many scripts out there, especially now, um, but even then, that have female protagonists, that have, that are stories that are not centered around white men, <laughs> that can be told. Um, and I decided that I, if nobody else was going to do it, then I guess I was going to have to be the one to do it. <laughs> well, and you've been on the, the, the uh, play reading committee with me. Uh, yes. Uh, Sandy Armstrong says, well, we know where Karen's going. <laughs> we, 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 we know what's going to, we got an idea what's going to be on her list. And sure enough. You did yes. not. You, you did not fail. You no. Took, boom, 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 boom. No. So, well, it's you know. It, here's the thing. Like for for hundreds of years, thousands of years, we've had one perspective, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and people always say to me, "Why do we have to do a season that has three shows with all these women in it?" And I said, "Because for thousands of years, we had all these shows with men in it." <laughs> I'm just looking for a parody at yeah. this point. Like it, it's. It's when you look at the pool of people who audition for us, it's probably four fifths cis women, non binary, trans, and one fifth cis men. So, shouldn't the the stories we tell and the roles available reflect that as well? I mean, that kind of makes sense to well, me. Well, there's a there's a, a a frame at the Footlight Club that shows uh, you the cast of some show. And I'll never forget someone said, geez, they're not very pretty women, are they? And I go, because they're not women. It was all these men that were playing the female roles. It's a female role, but they had guys, men doing it. Yeah. And um, you know, the late Bill Dasha, I would never, he gave me a statistic once that said something about 60 or 70% of the plays that are written or uh, written by men and the casts are 80 or 90% male. Yeah, so, it's outrageous. And then there's Karen who says, oh, no, we're going to change. <laughs> and it's, you know, I, I, to me, it doesn't sound revolutionary, yeah. right? Like when we, when we look at the population, <laughs> it's like, shouldn't, shouldn't art reflect yeah. the people who are going to come and see it? Um, and shouldn't, if we are telling the stories that are interesting to humanity, shouldn't we include all of humanity in that? <laughs> it doesn't seem revolutionary to me. Um, 
And I don't think that I am the only person who can tell these stories. I just saw that there was a gap to be filled, yeah. and I thought, o okay, I'll, I'll step up. Yeah, I was going to say, you're one of the few that <laughs> stepped up. So then, so then what would your advice be to someone starting out, I'll say with the acting first, because I almost cannot see somebody, oh, I'm going to go into directing, and they haven't acted before. Um, I, so I think... It's strangely enough, I think it's being a critical audience member is a good step because we absorb so much content, right? Like we watch TV, we watch movies, we watch plays, and we know what we like. Everybody has different opinions, but we know what we like. Um, and oftentimes the story is a lot of what we like because it resonates with us on a certain level. But when you start breaking it down into, like, why did you like that actor, you know? Um, why does Viola Davis resonate with you? What did she do? What is it about her performance that, that resonated with you? Um, and you start asking people those questions. Even someone with no acting experience can say to you, well, she was really believable. Like, I, I knew who she was. Connected. And every role she plays, she makes a connection to the material. You believe that she is who she is. Um, whether it's, you know, how to get away with murder or fences or, you know, those are very different characters in very different time periods. But you believe that she's that person yeah. when you're watching her. What is it about that? Um, so when, you, when you're watching something and you're thinking about, I'd like to try this acting thing, look at that performance with a critical eye and figure out what it is it that they're doing that you're enjoying. Okay. Um, and we talk a lot about, like in comedies, like comic timing. Like what is it? What is that comic timing yeah. thing? Um, and it's the way that someone delivers a line you can tell when someone has the ability to deliver a line in a way that makes you laugh, right? Like there's certain people who just do it perfectly. Um, and when you see it, you know it. Um, and when you start listening to a rhythm and you pick up on the fact that, oh, there's something about like the pace of that. I always say to people, faster is funnier. There's something about that mm -hmm. quickness. Um, so you can learn a lot just by being a critical audience member. Um, and then to go into community theaters and not only be an actor, but work behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I was about to say, yeah. Like be a stage manager, do the props, do the costumes, like work in all those different aspects because you think that, well, how's that going to help my acting? And I'm like, because you're you're being a part of all that process and the collaboration and you're... Um, you're absorbing things and you don't even yes. realize it. You yeah. Know, and you get to see things in some cases, if you're working props or you're working set or crew, you get to see it over and over because there's certain things I think that, oh, I didn't see that Thursday or I didn't see that Friday night, but then, you know, because I was doing thus and so, but you saw it happen in Saturday or Sunday and it's just... I mean, that's why some people read the same authors over and over, but they don't like different authors. So then, in, in acting, what were some of your favorite roles? Because oh, I don't want to miss that. Oh, wow. Um, you know, it's funny. It's the, the ones that stand out for me are always the, it's so much of it is the, the collaborative process as, as well as the role itself. Um, and I always, the, the more recent ones, of course, always jump out at you. So, um, just last year I did a play called El Amasonary. Um, and it's, it's a toughie. Yeah, it is. That's a it toughie. Is. For those of you <laughs> who don't know, it's only three people and it's... It's very wordy. Yeah, very. And it's intense. And it's, a, it's a story about, um, three women and it's a generational family story. Um, grandmother, mother, granddaughter. Um, and so it's 
the language is gorgeous. It's poetry, but it's challenging. Um, it has its own inherent rhythm. Um, the characters are so well defined. Their relationship is challenging. So playing those connections and figuring out those connections, um, the, the lack of props and sets yeah. to help you, yeah. right? Because it's very spare. And the um, space that you did it in. Yes, we did it in a very small black box. So Curtain it's very call intimate. Is small. You can't escape. You can't hide. Right. Which the is audience a bad. is right it's there. Just that. Yeah, so you have to be true. Yes. You have to be very truthful. And people are right on top of you, so they they can read you. Yeah, so to speak. you can't hide. Yeah. Any moment has to be very real. Um, and so the the experience of working specifically with those two other women, um, the trust that you have to establish, um, the rhythm of it, um, the, the young woman who played my granddaughter in particular, Cassidy, was just so delightful to work with. We had a, a significant number of scenes together and... Um, so who played the daughter? Uh, her name was Britt Garner. Oh, okay. She was delightful as well. Um, but I also just loved the character. Like, she was larger than life, but she was also so flawed. Um, and she grew up at a time when um, women were, had very specific defined roles. And she did not fit to that very specific defined mm. role. Um, and so to find your place in a world that was not built for you um, is a real struggle. Um, and so playing that character was a gift and to say those lines every night was a gift. And that was one of the ones that I felt like I, I could have gone on forever wow. playing that role. So that one in particular really stands out. So then, uh, and I'm not saying, you know, because it maybe had a good box office or whatever, but what was one of your favorites that you had in directing? Oh, wow. <laughs> so again, when you think about, you know, collaborative process, it was probably, <sighs> five women wearing the same dress. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, hey, who did you direct that for? Uh, it? Burlington for the Burlington Players. Oh, that's um, okay. And uh, did those did those dresses go around to them too? <laughs> they did. They they made their way around. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think you know partly because it was a cast of mostly cis women. Um, which I thoroughly enjoy working with. Um, the story was, you know, I, fine, but the, it was the, the process of working with a group of folks who were so committed to their characters, their relationships, to telling the story well. Um, my assistant director, Katie Gluck, was outstanding. Um, she was my producer on the last show I right. just directed, and, and she is, if anybody gets to work with her, she's a gem she in everything she does, just a true gem. You know, she, was doing, she did a show at festival or something, and I said to her, you're going to win. The, oh, no. I said, you're going to win this award. Oh, Susan, says, stop. <laughs> so so she, when she won, I said, well, you didn't win that, so give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she's terrific. She has so much knowledge in so many different areas of theater and and she's not a person who stands up and says pay attention to me yeah. so she often goes under the radar um and it's great for those of us who know because yeah. we can grab her when yeah. we need her um but she she brought so much to the table i almost always work with an assistant director when uh -huh. i direct because um, I always feel like there more eyes on anything and more hands on anything is is good. Um, I I never, for me, it always seems strange that one person kind of wants to be in charge. Yeah. that's a lot. It is. <laughs> 
I always want more people to to have eyes and whispers in yeah. my ear. And did you see this? Are you feeling that? Are you, you know, I was thinking this. Um, any kind of challenge to like, why did you pick that? Why did you pick that to, for me to have to justify my choices? Um, means that I have to really think very deeply about why this moment is important, why this character choice is important. Um, and she was so great at that. But the whole cast was, was so strong. Who was strong. in that cast? I think that's when I was... Uh, Becca Shore, oh, wow. Allie McCann, uh, Becca Leighton Healy, uh, Katie Pompeo, <gasps> uh, Shane Doherty, Jennifer Shea. So... That Jen Shea. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I love that woman. Yeah, it was a it, it was a delightful yeah. group of people. And Becca Shaw, she's something else. Yeah. You yeah. know, there's people that you go, oh yeah, they're pretty good. They're, yeah, they're good. And then you see them in something else and you go, oh my gosh, you didn't think they could get any better. Yep. But yeah, and Allie McCann, sadly, has moved up to Portland, oh. Maine, um, but she does theater up there oh, okay. now. And uh Becca Leighton Healy is now, uh, she's been away from theater for a bit because she has two little ones at home. And, and Becca Shaw is going to be gone for a while. I know. She of, is a new little yes, one at so. home. So, yeah. But it's, you know, it was just such a, a, a lovely group of people to work with. So that was part of why that one stands out in particular. So is there a role that you'd like to do <laughs> down the road? I guess I'm kind of combining my lap. Is there something that's on your bucket list to perform and or bucket list to direct? So when I was younger, um, there were a lot of bucket list roles, okay. right? Um, because it was, you know, like, oh, all these things, you know, these wonderful roles. As I get older... Um, it's more about being a part of telling really good stories because what you realize as you get older is that there are fewer and fewer roles out there as you get older. This is again coming back around to that. Who tells the stories and what stories are available out there? So it, for me, it's more about presenting uh, the work of really excellent playwrights. Um, such as Lynn Nottage, oh, okay. Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, um, local, unknown, unpublished mm -hmm. playwrights. Um, I think we just did at the Burlington Players uh, an unpublished work, although it's about to be published. Um, and I think that that is one area where I think community theater sometimes falls short. Um, I'm involved with the AAPC group here in Boston. Um, I get to do their uh, short play festival often in the fall, and the Burlington Players are collaborating with them for a show coming up in February, March. Um, and there are so many wonderful local playwrights that I feel like community theater could very easily take one show in their season and, and produce <laughs> an unpublished script. They're usually voices that we don't get to hear very often. Um, I'm happy to direct and or act. <laughs> I'm putting that out there right now. In any of those, um, I think supporting new work is really important. So. So my bucket list okay. is to um, bring any um, lesser seen, heard voices to the stage for whatever reason. Um, okay, people, she's just being cute. She's not going to give me any titles. <laughs> <laughs> I've known her too long. She's like, well. <laughs> well, to be fair, I mean, we're doing a, a, a clip just a short from um, Brandon Jacobs Jenkins' play, Everybody, for Vokes Scene Night. Oh, okay. Um, so that is a title that I think that people should pick up on. Uh, it was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, so you think it would be war more well-known. Um, but no. Um, why? BIPOC playwright, right? Um, Hovey is doing appropriate, so huzzah. Um, 
but I know Lynn Nottage's sweat is starting to make the rounds. But that's like trying great. to do it. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I, and you, listen, I mean, it's wonderful to see some of the big names like Sarah Rule and Lauren Gunderson. Some of these fantastic female playwrights are starting to be standard on people's um, season lists. That's wonderful to see. We need more of that. Um, but uh, Larissa Fast Horse, the Thanksgiving play, that's starting to show up. Great. More of that, okay. right? So there well, we go. <laughs> Karen, thank you for joining us here behind the curtain. I'm Susan Harrington, and our guest was Karen Durbin. Thank you. Thank you.